I want to begin with a three-tiered working definition of what the Christian church means by the sovereignty of God, a three-tiered working definition. And the first layer or the first tier is this. What we mean by the sovereignty of God is that as the creator of all things, God is the supreme authority over all things that he has created that as the creator of all things, God is the sovereign or the supreme authority over all things that he has created. Paul captures the sense of this in Colossians chapter 1 in verses 16 and 17. For by him all things were created in things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is also captured in the angelic worship that is recorded in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they they exist and are created. So one of the things that the Christian church means when we talk about the sovereignty of God is that God as the creator of all things is the sustainer of all things. And there is nothing that he has created that is beyond his power or that operates independent of his will or his purpose. God is not like Dr. Frankenstein, who is able to create a monster that he cannot control. God is the supreme creator of all things, and all things that he has created are under his sovereign will. A second thing that we mean by God's sovereignty is that he is free from any external control. He is an absolute sovereign in this, that there is no one outside of him that determines what he is or will do. Again, if we go to scriptures, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, Paul says that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. There is nothing external to him that causes God to act or react to anything. But also in Romans chapter 11, verses 34 through 36, Paul has written this, for we, for for who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Whatever he does with and whatever he does in creation is not determined by anything that is external to him. God has created all things. And God is the sovereign and supreme ruler over everything that he has created. And there is nothing outside of him that causes him to act so that he is reacting to anything that he has created. Here's a third tier to that meaning. When we say that God is sovereign, 
we also mean that he is autonomous, which is to say that not only is he free from external control, but he is governed by no other law than himself. God is governed by nothing other than the integrity of his character and the totality of his attributes. So God is not subject to the laws of man as we know them. As a matter of fact, all of God's, all of the laws that we know that govern us are an expression of God's governing of his universe. So again, let's think of these things. What do we mean when we talk about God as being sovereign? What we mean is that God is the creator of all things and he is the supreme authority over everything that he has created. And there are no exceptions there. It means that God is not governed by anything external to him in his governing of all things. And it means that he is not subject to any law other than himself. Now, we as human beings, we push back on that. We push back against the concept of absolute sovereignty, largely because some of us have Lord Acton's idea in our minds, uh, ruminating in our minds and our thoughts, that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so in our fallen state, I think there are two camps. Number one, when we speak of unregenerate fallen human beings, we push back against the concept of sovereignty because that's part of our fallen nature to be in rebellion against God as anything being a a sovereign authority. In other words, one of the things that precipitated the fall was that the serpent said, you will be like God. And that was part of what caused them to act. And so being with the desire to be like God in our fallen state, naturally, we are rebels. We are inclined towards ourselves. And being inclined towards ourselves, we, we, we become our own standard of right and we will sub- submit only to that which we agree to submit to. All of us by nature are rebels against any authority outside of us. All of us have that toddler living inside of us. You're not the boss of me. And so the unregenerate sinner pushes back against the concept of something and someone and that they don't see as being over them because in our natural fallen state, we resist anyone telling us anything to do. But also, even with regenerate sinners, there is a degree of pushback when it comes to understanding the sovereignty of God, and that's for a lot of reasons. Some of them are well-intended, but they're still wrong. Part of it is we look at the idea of human freedom. If God is sovereign over all things, then what about free will? Does that mean that we are robots and we're only doing what God has programmed us to do? Are we saying that, that, that free will is a myth? I like the way John, well, first off, let me say this about free, human freedom. Human freedom is a divine, is, is a derivative concept. We're not absolutely free. You see, only God is absolutely free. We are, a free will exists because our creator has created us in that way. But let me explain what Jonathan Edwards, how Jonathan Edwards describes free will because I believe that a lot of humans have wrong concepts of what is meant by free will. Jonathan Edwards says, the will is nothing more than the mind choosing. I want to pause there for a moment because oftentimes, even among Christians, we define the will in such a way that it's a separate faculty, that it's something, it's a different part of our being. And so one of the ways I like to illustrate it is this. If you're sitting down, I could say, put your hands in your lap. And you would all know what I meant. And so you can do that if you want. Put your hands in your lap. 
Now imagine yourself standing up. And then I say, now put your hands in your lap. You'd look around. Why? Because when you stand, what we mean by lap doesn't exist. Lap is really the posture of our thighs when we, the top of our thighs when we are seated. But when you stand, because you're not seated, you don't have a lap to put your hands in. Jonathan Edwards says, the will is nothing more than the mind choosing. It's not a separate faculty of our existence, it's a function of something that's already there. The will is nothing more than the mind choosing, and the mind always chooses what it perceives to be of the highest good. And the perception of good is according to its nature. And far be it from me to tweak anything that Jonathan Edwards says, but I would add this one little caveat, that not only does it perceive according, what it, what it chooses according to what, to what it perceives to be uh, of the highest good, but the highest good is determined by various circumstances. So even in the rege- regenerated mind, the will is nothing more than the mind choosing, and because in regeneration we have the capacity to choose according to our union with Christ, or we can choose according to our fallen nature, the reality is everything that man does, he does freely. So if someone came up to you and said, well, give me your wallet, and you feared that they might have a gun, and then you gave them your wallet, you would say, well, is that I didn't freely do it. Yes, you did. Because you freely chose to give your wallet rather than suffer the possible consequences of not doing it. And so, therefore, we are always free, and so there is nothing that God determines or God allows that interferes with free will. But here's the other thing that causes us to push back against the idea of an an absolute sovereign God. Even in the state of regeneration, we push back against God's sovereignty because of what we see in the created order. And therefore, reasoning from what we know about God's character, we would say, If God is good, then why is the world not good? Or, on the other hand, we would assume that when we see anything that we approve of, we would assume that anything that God, that that is, that takes place in the created order is because God has favorably approved of it. So we are either in this quandary of assuming that If something exists that is not good and God is sovereign and he doesn't stop it, then maybe there's a defect in his character or in his ability. Or sometimes we jump on the bandwagon and we will assume that because a thing exists as it is, then then God favorably approves of it. Well, let me let me add to what we have given concerning the church's historic understanding of the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. Let me summarize this, the the church's teaching with two statements from the Westminster Confession of Faith. In chapter 3, on God's God's eternal decree, And then we will look at a statement from uh, the the chapter on God's providence. So in chapter 3 of the Westminster Confession, Article 1, on God's eternal decree, here's what the confession says. God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel 
of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass, yet so as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather they are established. The Westminster Confession on the eternal decree of God is, is, is making the statement that all things that take place are according to God's determined purpose and it does not interfere with the free actions of the actors. And it does not remove contingencies. As a matter of fact, it establishes it. One of the things that R.C. Would, uh, was, was, would, would talk about is concurrence that God's will is accomplished through the free will of, of sinful creatures. Even if they're not intending to do the will of God, they do His will. The example that He often, give, he, that he often gave was Genesis 50 where, where Joseph is talking about the actions of his brothers that led him to be sold into slavery and then ultimately he ascends to this high position in Egypt. And towards the end of when, when their father dies and his brothers are concerned that he would try to get vengeance upon them, then Joseph says this, you meant it for evil, but God intended it for good. And so God does use contingencies. He does work through means to bring about his ultimate purposes. But also in the very next chapter in the Westminster Confession, chapter 4, on the uh, doctrine of the providence of God. In Article 1, the confession says this, God, the great creator of all things, does uphold and direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest even to the least by his most wise and holy providence according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free, immutable counsel of his own will to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. Again, the idea that even as we look on the world as it is, even as we fret about the idea of, wait a minute, what is, is if, God's, if God is sovereign over all of the details of human experience, then am I a robot? Or, and I like this title that R.C. gave to a book, if there is a God, then why are there atheists? So the idea that if God is good, then why do we live in a fallen and evil world? or that perhaps God is good with the evil that's in the world. And so in understanding providence, the combination of the eternal decree of God and the concept of God's, of, 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 of God, uh, His providence at work in the created order, the bottom line remains. There is nothing that takes place within God's created universe that is outside of his purpose, and that is beyond his power, and that operates independent of his divine will. Now, that's hard for us to digest. It, it just is. Now, let me just look at some conclusions from these two, th two statements. What this means, one, is this, that the free, sinful actions and they are sinful, of, human, of, of humans and fallen angels are somehow governed by God's sovereign purpose. 
the free sinful actions of humans and angels. That even means demonic activity are somehow governed by God's sovereignty. Brothers and sisters, we don't live in a world with equally or equal, equally powerful forces with one trying to win. That's not when we talk about the presence of evil, and sometimes we get that, we, we reach that wrong conclusion when we look at places in the New Testament that speak of Satan, for instance, as the God of this world. That doesn't mean that God gave him the keys. The Puritans used to say that Satan is wicked and he's evil and he's active, but he's God, Satan. And it's hard even for Christians sometimes to wrap their minds around the fact that the purposes of God are being accomplished even through demonic activity and sinful human actions. But if that weren't the case, then God is not sovereign over all things. Here's another conclusion that we can extract from these confessional statements. The disorders and disasters that are experienced within the created order are also governed by God's sovereign purposes. What do I mean by disorders and disasters? I, I hail from the state of California where we are used to earthquakes. I live in the state of Florida and I happen to live in an, a, a part of Florida that's called Hurricane Alley. Half the year we are under hurricane watch. Hurricanes and earthquakes were, 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 are the result of something and they are ongoing. Tsunamis happen. And when, when they happen, we call them natural disasters. And they are natural disasters, but they are natural disasters that are under the sovereign rule and control of God. We have a difficulty with that. And we should. And you'll see in a moment that I'm going to argue that, that, that there is, we, we, God allows us to experience it so that we can be appalled. Because when we hear of devastating earthquakes, and when we hear of tsunamis and all of the destructions that are wreaked, we think of the loss of human life. And we... Even now, sicknesses that are in the air, we are masked because there's a pandemic. And some have put their fingers in their ears and shaking the rebel, their rebel fists and saying, no, it doesn't exist. Yet in our own nation, almost 400,000 have died, and we try to explain it. But whatever it is or however you define it, it too is under the sovereign rule of God. Brothers and sisters, there's not a tree that falls. There's not a bird that falls from the air that somehow is not under the sovereign governing hand of the creator of all things. Now there are, if you, if you look at this, if you look at this statement, both from providence, reasoning from providence and reasoning from, from the eternal decree, one of the things that, that both of these statements seem to point towards 
is God's consummate, ultimate glory. In other words, God's sovereign purposes that, that direct the course of human history actually have a twofold eschatological aim. And I say that because oftentimes, whatever issues that we have with the sovereignty of God, it's in the realm of time. And so let me just look at these, this, two, these two, this twofold aim, eschatological aim of God's sovereign purposes. One is this, the one aim that all of God's sovereign purposes that govern human history that it reaches towards is the glory of His holy justice in the eternal condemnation of the wicked. So all of God's sovereign purposes move in one direction, or at least in eschatologically, it moves towards the revelation of the glory of God's holy justice in the eternal condemnation of the wicked. The words of the angel in Revelation chapter 16, verses 5 through 7 captures this. And this is, this is as, the, as God's wrath, one of the bowls of wrath is poured out on the earth, and the angel says this, just are you, O holy one, who was and who is, for you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, it is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. All that God allows under His sovereign governing of human history has as its aim ultimately God, God's, the glory of His holy justice in the condemnation of the wicked. We haven't seen all of that yet. You see, brothers and sisters, what we've seen is a progressive unfolding of eternal and coming judgment. Because here's the assumption, and, and I remember growing up as a kid when someone would be, tell something that they knew that might be suspect, it might not be the truth, and they, they would say, kids would say, well, if I'm lying, let, I hope God strikes me down. Because there's a built-in assumption that the moment evil occurs, it's immediately judged. We have resonating in our minds what the Lord told Adam, the day you eat, you'll surely die. And we've reasoned from that he began to die, and he did die spiritually. But the day of Adam's death and the condemnation, the ultimate condemnation that God is promising towards all wickedness has not been seen. I will show you one place where it has been previewed, but everything else is a progressive unfolding of His coming in absolute and eternal judgment. God allows us to see wicked so that we could see how wicked really is. But it still moves towards His final consummate judgment of the wicked. And no one will say in that day that it isn't deserved. But God's governing or His sovereign purposes that governs the course of human history also has the eschatological aim of God's, of the glory of God's saving grace in saving or redeeming undeserving sinners from the wrath that they actually deserve. 
Everything that he allows is moving towards, everything that he governs is moving towards the ultimate revelation of his glory in the condemnation of the wicked, but it's also moving towards the glory of his grace in saving and redeeming undeserving sinners. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul outlines the contours of our fallen nature. He says that we were all dead in trespasses and sins and that we walked according to the prince of the power of the air. We, like all of the rest of them, he says ultimately in verse 3, that we were by nature children of wrath. Then he in verse 4. I like what Martin Lloyd-Jones says that we see this grim picture that turns on two words, but God. Here's what we were in verses 1 through 3. Here's what we deserved in verses 1 through 3. But in verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, our experience in time is in the context of a creation that is under a curse. Adam and Eve walked out of the garden covered in the skins of an animal that died. And the Lord told Adam, you'll still live and you'll still work the fields, but now you'll have thistles. Now the happy home is going to be, there's going to be conflict. In the very next chapter of Genesis, is in, Gen- in Genesis 4, we have the, s- the first murder. Brothers and sisters, the context in which we experience God's saving grace is a world that's under a curse. And so human history, as difficult as it is for us to understand, human history itself and all of the created order, as Paul says in Romans, has been subjected to bondage. And here's what we see. We don't just see brother killing brother. We see social disorder. We see evil men rising. That's what Nebuchadnezzar says, you are the Lord of heaven. You let men rise up and you bring them down. We see holocausts. We see apartheid. We see chattel human slavery. We see injustice. We see suffering. And we don't just see it out there because what we see out there lives in here. The world is nothing more than the manifestation and, and, and really the, the codifying of the evil that lies and lives within each of us. And God, through this, brings to bear The fact that although this is what we deserve and we see the flood, we see, we see the fire falling on Sodom and Gomorrah. Brothers and sisters, all of that 
is a warm-up act. Let me show you one place in Scripture where, where really we see those two eschatological aims being played out before our very eyes. The way the writer of, or, or the way um, Peter expresses it on the day of Pentecost when he preaches that great sermon in chapter 1, verse 23 of the book of, or chapter 2, verse 23 of, of uh, the book of Acts, Peter says this, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. I would argue this, that what what, what reconciles the mystery of God's sovereign rule of human history moving towards the dual eschatological goal of God being justified in the condemnation of sinners and glorified in the redemption that he gives by free grace finds their convergence in the death of Jesus. Because God the fullness of divine wrath that will be fully experienced. The only other time what we saw on Calvary will be experienced is at the end of the age. Sodom and Gomorrah was only a warm-up act for what was to come. The flood and everything that was experienced in it was only a foretaste. But what Jesus experienced on the cross is the fullness of divine wrath that will not be experienced again until the end of the age. And brothers and sisters, from that vantage point, those of us who look to the cross for our salvation, we will be no more saved than we are right now as we look to what God has done through Christ and who has been raised from the dead. My point is this. Our experience in time is in the context of a creation that has been subjected to bondage and futility where evil abounds. But here's where our hope and our confidence is, that our Heavenly Father, who is the sovereign ruler of the universe, is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called by him. God is sovereign. And there is not anything that exists that is beyond his power and that is outside of his will. And as long as we only look at it from the lens of time, we'll always confuse it and misrepresent him. And so he points us forward to the end, where we are reminded that in the end, as our confession has said, that all things will lead to the ultimate revelation of his glory as the sovereign Lord of human history. God allows us to live in evil, in, in evil times, and it's not that he's making the times evil. He is showing us. He has said, as, as Paul says in Romans 1, that he has, he's turned us over to our own minds, and in spite of it, and this is the beauty of his grace, he saves and he saves to the uttermost those who come to him by faith. There are no accidents from God's standpoint. 
There are no mistakes and there is no excuse for evil. But God in his sovereign purpose will bring us to a point where we will truly see evil for what it is in its judgment, in which case we will rejoice even greater in the display of his grace because his grace extends the justice that we have deserved. God is sovereign. And as we go through difficult and challenging days, know that he who saved you is in control. And there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing past, nothing present, nothing future. Because by his son, whom he has offered up to show you how serious he is against evil, he has not withheld his wrath from his son. Therefore, he will not withhold his love and his grace from you. He's sovereign, and he's good, and he's faithful, and he's just, and he's gracious, and it is he who is in control. Let's pray. Gracious God, our Father, our times, our days, our moments are in your hand. You are the sovereign ruler of all things. When we did not deserve your love, you snatched us from condemnation. And even though we experience the evidence of your curse all around us, you preserve us by your grace. We pray that as we journey to the point where you will call it in, that we will not lose hope and that we will not get anxious because we know that just as there is no bird that will fall from the sky without you knowing, there is no falling star, there is no maverick planet that will destroy before you have determined. What you have determined will be so let us fix our eyes on your Son and the cross upon which he bore your wrath so that we won't have to. And the fact that he who died rose and is presently seated at your right hand where we are united to him by faith. Let that be the lens through which we gaze at each day that you dispense to us according to your sovereign purposes. We thank you for Jesus, and it is in his great name that we pray. Amen.